morning, everybody. Good morning. Well, um, I'm going to do the welcome this morning. So um, welcome, everyone, first and foremost, to the Odyssey Church. I know it's not the best day to come out to church, but, you know, for you, you guys who came out, you know, we appreciate it. You guys are warriors. <laughs> the back of your chairs. Um, Unless you're in the front row, um, there are connection <laughs> there are connection cards. If this is your first time here and you want to fill one out and put one into the offering plate when it comes around, you can just fill out you know your information, uh, your name, address, and we're not going to stalk you or anything. It's just um, you know it's just a great way for us to like send out information for you in case you're more interested in our church because we send out our quarterly newsletter. And um, of course, if you're also interested in uh, volunteering for the church, um, you know like for music, um, of course you know we got uh, first. First Impressions team, we got a children's ministry, there's so much um, areas of the church you can volunteer for. Uh, just please fill it out and you can just drop it in the plate when it comes around. Um, on, uh, on Friday nights we have movie night. Um, if you guys want to come out and uh, catch a movie in the movie this week, uh, you know what it is, Rob? The Easter Experience. The Easter Experience. And that's going to kick off the Bible, that's going to kick off the Bible study that's going to start on that also called the Easter Experience. That's right, this Friday at 7. Seven o'clock, okay. But uh, I sort of want to ask you a question this morning because I, I don't know about you, but I felt this way at times. Have you ever sort of felt like God maybe wanted to bless everybody else, but maybe not you? I mean, do you think that God truly wants to bless you? And, and I thought about that because I, I know what the scripture says. The scriptures tell us, and there's a couple different ones that I picked out. Uh, one comes from 3 John verse 2. It says, Beloved, I pray that you prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Acts 10 34 says, Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. And in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17, or chapter 8, verses 17 and 18, it says, You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me, but remember that your Lord, your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce, to produce wealth, and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your forefathers, as it is then. So as I read these scriptures, I think that God most certainly wants to bless each one of us. And it says that he shows no favoritism. It says that he gives us this power, and he wouldn't give us this power if he didn't want to bless us. But we have to remember who it all belongs to. In Haggai chapter 2, verse 8, the prophet says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. In Psalms 50, 10, it says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and a cow on a thousand hills. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, who has first given to him and then repaid to him? For of him and through him and in him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Romans 11, 34 verses uh, through, Romans chapter 11, verses 34 through 36. And then in 2 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, it says, both riches and honors come from you. And what he's saying is that everything belongs to God. And I think sometimes in the world, the world is a whole, and I've used this celebration before, I have a friend of mine who's very, very wealthy. Between him and his wife, they make about a half a million dollars a year. And yet they don't give away any money because they think it all belongs to them. And when it's our stuff, we have a hard time giving it away. But if we just realize that it belongs to God, that we're just stewards of it, it becomes easier to give. I want you guys to know, for those of you that have been coming here for a while, we have had so many blessings because of you. We have had the opportunity to minister to people and help people. Uh, uh, I had the opportunity to go to Milford uh, last week and, and on Saturday and meet with the gentleman who passed away on Sunday. Uh, we were up at Coastal Hospice on Sunday right after church. I went to minister to a lady who, who's homebound and just had surgery on her shoulder and she's in so much pain. And, uh, Monday night we went down to uh, the homeless shelter and stayed there for a while as one of their uh, recipients passed away. Uh, it, it, it's, just, it's just been a blessing and it's all because of you. Our tithes, what we give, are actually changing lives. We sow, we reap, and therefore we should rejoice. So as uh, I ask, you know, Jimmy, do you mind just passing the basket around this morning? Give as you feel free. There's no obligation. There, there, just give what you can, or if you can't, we, we just love you. 
And while we're doing this, we're going to get ready for the service, and I'm going to promise not to speak over an hour, hour and a half, because I know you guys want to go home. Nobody caught that, did Good morning once again, church family. We're going to continue our service in just a minute, but before... Before we do, just a couple of special announcements. First, while we're passing the basket around, did you know there's another way to give to the Odyssey? That's right. Starting today, you can give us your credit or debit card in person, and we can swipe it, and all you have to do is sign. Or if you're forgetful like me, just go ahead to our website, check out our brand new donation button, and arrange to have your deduction taken out automatically every month. It really is that simple. Next up is a plea for help. We need you. We need help every Sunday with our children and our babies in our nursery and classroom. If you like babies or children and who can't resist those adorable faces, see Pastor Rob or myself today. And don't worry about missing church because starting soon, March 1st as a matter of fact, we're going to be starting a second service. That's right, at 9.30 and 11.15. So whether you're an early riser or you like to sleep in, we'll be here for you. Two services means two chances to invite someone you know to church. Last week, Pastor Rob invited all of us to write down the names of people we know, and we will send them something, inviting them to church on Easter Sunday. That way, when you call them, they'll already know all about it. Easter's a great time to invite someone to church because it really is the start of the church as we know it. So go ahead, write down those names, get them to us, and be prepared for something very special we have coming up on Easter Sunday. More details coming soon, so write down those names today. What's that? You weren't here last week? Don't worry, you were not the only one. And believe me when I say it was a very unique service. So be sure to check us out online to hear last week's service. Everybody say it with me now, www.theodysseychurch.com and click on the Listen and Learn page. Now, coming up this week, we've got lots going on. This Tuesday is known as Mardi Gras or Shrove Tuesday or even better, Fat Tuesday. Which is Fat Tuesday, you might be asking? Well, Fat Tuesday, which in French, by the way, is pronounced Mardi Gras, get the connection, dates back hundreds of years when people would gather and use up all their fat and meats and sugars before they fasted for the 40 days of Lent. Nowadays, we tend to skip the fasting part, and who can blame you? But it's still fun to celebrate. So this year, we're going to celebrate with all the other area local churches at Mariner's Bethel in Ocean View, Tuesday the 17th from 5 to 7 p.m. with a pancake supper. So come on out and join us. Then the very next day, Wednesday, kicks off Lent, and we will be celebrating here at the Odyssey with a very special, solemn Ash Wednesday service. We will be placing ashes and celebrating Holy Communion. So plan to come out with, for a time of reflection as Lent kicks off. Then after that, every Wednesday following, be sure to join us at another area local church as we all gather as a community for a starting out with a light soup and salad dinner and then a very special interdenominational joint church service. So check us out and the schedule will be posted online. Now here at the Odyssey, we're gonna do something even better. We're gonna take our Friday movie night this Friday and start it off with the Easter experience. And then after that, every Friday during Lent, we're going to discuss the movie about, and the Easter experience itself. I mean, can you imagine? What if everything that happened way back then changed everything that happened now? Now, have you ever seen this movie? Because I haven't. So check this trailer out now, right before Pastor Rob speaks. And even if you've heard this story a thousand times, even if you've given up on anything that smells religious, even if you have a dozen different distractions, and even if you just don't care, would you just paint yourself into this story and truly experience it? Let's just go through this together and honestly ask ourselves, so what, who cares, What's all this mean to me? Let's travel together through this Easter experience and find out for ourselves. What if what happened then changes everything now?
exciting time of year for people that have been in church for a while. For those of you who maybe haven't been, let me tell you a little bit of what's going on. Uh, how many of you thought that Mardi Gras was a great big celebration and party in uh, New Orleans? Right. And, you know, if you can't believe in God sometimes, you know, take a look at what the devil does. And Mardi Gras is actually a religious holiday. It started out that way. And as Jennifer said, it was called a Fat Tuesday, which French means Mardi Gras. And everybody would take everything they had because Lent is a season of repentance, a, a, a season of renewal, a season of drawing closer to God. And during that period of time, most people fasted years ago. So they, they knew they were going to fast on Wednesday, so they would everybody in the community would grab all the stuff they couldn't eat during the, the time of Lent, and they would have a huge party, and everybody would eat. And they called it Fat Tuesday because you ate everything you could. Everybody gained about 10 pounds, sort of like Christmas, and then they went through the rest of the season repenting and, and fasting and working their way towards God. But I do want to thank you for coming out today because I know that it is bitter cold out there. When I last checked the weather, it was nine degrees outside. It had a, a, a wind chill factor of negative seven. Now, I, I, I've been saying all week, you know, God has this wonderful sense of humor. I said, I'm going to be happy when there is a seven in the temperature. Now, by that, I'm at like 70 plus. <laughs> And God says, okay, you want a seven? I'll give you a seven. Negative seven. I said, okay, okay. I've got to be more specific in my prayer life. All right, but I do want to thank everybody for coming out tonight and, 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 or this afternoon. And, and it's a special time because I'm glad you're here this weekend, but there's so many other places you could be. This is, this is a big, big weekend. I mean, first of all, yesterday was Valentine's Day. So down in Ocean City, they had all kinds of Valentine's weekend specials. It's... Uh, uh, Boat show weekend down there, so you can be down there. A lot of you don't, may not know this, it, it's President's Day weekend. And being the good Americans that we all are, we could be at the mall and spending all our money trying to help the uh, economy here in the United States. But there's a couple weekends, you know, that, that maybe you don't know about. Like, like today is a great day because I don't know whether you like uh, gumdrops or not, but today is National Gumdrop Day. So before the season of Lent, eat all the gumdrops that you can. This, I think, is probably a cool trick on somebody's part. And Bryce, you might want to pay attention to this, because this has to do with you. The day, anybody know what the day after Valentine's Day is? It is Singles Awareness Day. Now, how cool is that? You, you celebrate all the couples, and if you're single, you get your own day right after, right after Valentine's Day, and you hear all this mushy stuff. And look at the picture they used to, to describe it. Like, there you are, all alone on, on a park bench, looking at the couples go by. And, and even look at the, at the initials. It, it's S-A-D. It, it's National Sad Day. <laughs> so if you guys are single, I, mean, I just want you to be aware. We, we feel for you, you know? <laughs> but it's also a very important day on the church calendar. And that's really what we're going to be talking about the day before the Easter celebration. It's called Transfiguration Sunday. Now, Transfiguration is the day where Jesus took three of his closest disciples up onto the top of, of what most theologians believe to be Mount Hermon, and there he transfigured into his glorious body. He transformed into his glorious body. So this week, as we begin to start the Easter season, it's hard for me to believe when it's, it's, it's 9 degrees outside that we are getting ready to go into the Easter season. But there's a lot going on this weekend. You already heard Jennifer said, meet us at Mariner's Bethel between 5 and 7. They have a free pancake dinner. It's uh, Pancake was one of the things that you couldn't have during uh, the season of Lent, so they would have that. Uh, they also serve ham. So it's pancake and ham. It's free. Uh, they have a basket out front if you want to give, but there's absolutely no obligation at all to give. It is a wonderful experience. Come out and fellowship with the body of Christ and eat their food. Then on Wednesday night, right here, we're going to have what's called an Ash Wednesday service. And Ash Wednesday is actually the official beginning of the Easter season. And hopefully it's going to be a very informative uh, service. You know, we're going to explain to you what happens and why we celebrate Ash Wednesday, why we celebrate the season of Lent, what to expect. But it's a very special service, too. It's a very solemn service. 
So we're going to do what they call the imposition of ashes, where they put the ashes on the forehead. And there's a reason that we do that. And we're also going to serve communion as we remember what Christ has done for us. So again, as I said earlier, uh, I'm really glad you're here. And I have to tell you, I don't think you're here by accident. I've been praying all week for this service. I, I looked at the weather last week. I knew it was going to be cold. I knew there wouldn't be a lot of people here. So whoever's here this morning, you're here for a reason, because I believe our God is sovereign. And, and today's message is about keeping the main thing, the main thing. And the main thing is always our Lord Jesus Christ. The main thing is always not just Jesus, but His radiant glory and His offer of salvation. Sometimes we forget why God gives us His Word. God gives us His Word so that we can know the Word. And according to John, one of, one of Jesus' closest disciples, the Word is Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus says that you come to know me so that you can come to know the Father. That I came to walk among you so that you could see me. And, and he says later to his disciples, if you have seen me, if you know me, then you know the Father as well. And if we come to church for any other reason, then to come and see Jesus so that we can know God and the living God, then we probably come for the wrong reason. Now, I, I've been in church for a long time. I, I know those people that come and they do things like conduct them. So they want to make sure that they've been seen or they want to meet the right people. That's not why you should come to church. You should always come to church so that you can see Jesus and you come to know Jesus and you know the Father. I love studying God's Word. I, I love it. It makes it more real to me. It, it, makes it, 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 it makes it all that more fascinating to me. Sometimes it scares me a little bit because I hear what He tells me I have to do and I know how to draw God's fall. But one thing I know about reading God's Word is God's Word is always on salvation. He, he wants us to live life and He wants us to live in more abundance. But He wants us to spend all eternity. That's where his heart is. He wants us to put our trust in Jesus, and he wants us to do that so that we can spend all of eternity with him. And sometimes, I'm just telling you, I, I think about that reality. And, and if you read the scriptures from the very beginning to the very end, it tells us that. And I think here's a God who not just created us, but he created everything seen and unseen. He created the moons and the stars and the planets. And the Bible says he even holds them into place. Here's a God that can have and do anything he wants. And his greatest desire, the thing that he loves the most, is when his children come to him so that they can spend all of eternity with the loving God. That, that just absolutely amazes me. But the fact is, the Word tells us that we are the crown of his creation. We are the, the, the top of everything he created. That he thinks more of us than he does anyone else. That we were made into his image. And he says, that's how much I love you. I, I love you so much that I want to spend all eternity with you. I love you so much that I want to come and walk among you. I love you so much that I want to get you to know my son so that you can know me. And I think about the great lengths that God goes through and goes through for, for people that fall so short like myself. And, and I just sometimes have a hard time fanning. But like I said, today, today is known on the church calendar as Transfiguration Sunday. It, it's a really important day. It's the Sunday before we meet, uh, before we go into Lent. And if you haven't been here for a while, uh, I sort of want you to know that we, we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew. At the beginning of the year, we started in Matthew. We're going to continue through Matthew as we look at his, his life, look at the life of Jesus. And, and we're, going to, we're going to continue to do that. But we're sort of changing direction today. Like I said, uh, Easter season officially starts this Wednesday. Uh, our service here starts at 6 o'clock. It's called an Ash Wednesday service. And it's going to be informative. It's going to be solemn. It's going to be special. We just ask you, know, if you can make it out, we'd love to have you here. But, but through the beginning of the year, we've been looking at Matthew through the eyes of a sinner. We're looking at Jesus through the eyes of a sinner called Matthew. And I say that since, since the Bible says that we're all sinners. concentrate on one person, one person who walked with Jesus, one person who knew Jesus personally, intimately, and, and wrote about the things that he saw. 
Now, if you missed any of these messages, as Jennifer's already said, you can go to www.theodysseychurch.com and you can watch them all. In fact, you can watch every message we've ever had since the beginning of our church services, and they should be there as long as there's an internet, as long as we have uh, power, computers, and things like that. But uh, today we are starting uh, a little different direction. Uh, instead of just looking at Jesus from the time he was born to the time of his death, we're, we're now going to start following Jesus as he heads to the cross. Uh, we're sort of calling this, this series Reverse the Curse. And there's a reason for that. The curse we're talking about is a curse that God placed upon the earth, placed upon mankind, placed upon everything on the earth when Adam and Eve failed to obey God in the Garden of Eden. And if you read that story, it's right at the beginning of your uh, Bibles. I think the Bible is so great. You know, you read two chapters and everything's perfect. And in chapter 3, we mess up, and the rest of the book is God telling us how to get back in relationship with us. You know, just two chapters in, and man's already messed up. But because there's always consequences. You know, if you're a child, and you mess up, and your parents catch you, you're going to have to pay consequences. Well, we're God's children. They messed up. There were consequences. And part of that consequence was that God put a curse upon the earth. Not just upon the earth, though. You know, the Bible says that he put this curse even upon the animals, even upon mankind. And then sometimes you have to think, you know, uh, thorns and thistles began to grow. And the earth is going to be going, hey, man, I didn't do nothing wrong. <laughs> Why you got me involved in this? The animals are probably going, hey, I didn't do nothing wrong. Why am I involved in this? Since the beginning of the year, we've been following Jesus. From the time he was in his mother's womb, all the way up, last week we saw him in, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 22, uh, as we've talked about um, Jesus and, and his ability to come into our lives and heal us, uh, and as we talked about the different things that Christ offered us. But now we're changing direction. We're, we're getting, ready to, getting ready to head to, to the Roman cross. So by the time Easter comes, we're, we're going to see Jesus all the way from the time he was in his mother's womb, all the way to the tomb, and even beyond. His birth, his death, and his resurrection. Now the Easter season, like I said, it officially starts this, this, this Wednesday, past Wednesday. Again, I just want to say, what I say it on time, you will remember it. If you come out and join us on Easter, or on Ash Wednesday, at 6 o'clock, and we'll have some candles lit, and it's just a great service. But today we're going to look at an event that happens in the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel is just really the story of Jesus' life. And it's recorded in chapter 17. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a strange story. It's a, it's a mysterious story. In fact, it's so strange and it's so mysterious that a lot of what they call the commentators, people that write about the Bible and try to explain it, a lot of them just get over I mean, it, it's an event as far as the record goes. It only takes place one time in the ministry of Jesus. As far as we can tell, this is the only time this ever happens. But the event is so important that it's recorded in three out of the four Gospels. It's recorded in what they call the synoptic Gospel. Uh, Sino means, means the same, optic means C. Uh, so the synoptic Gospels are the ones that, that are very similar. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they all call... Uh, and record this event. And every year we celebrate it on a Sunday before Lent. And then, of course, like I said, then it's called the Transfiguration Sunday. Transfigure means to change an outward appearance, change an outward form. There's a Greek word which is used. The Greek word is metamorpho. Metamorpho uh, is where we get the English word metamorphosis. So, so if you think about a caterpillar, and as it metamorphoses, it goes in, it goes into the cocoon as a, uh, as a caterpillar. Thank you. And it comes out as a butterfly. There you go. See. So there's a metamorphosis that takes place. Oh wait, beautiful butterfly. Right. And that's what happens to Jesus. Jesus on the top of this mountain transforms. He transfigures from his human body to his glorified body or his glorious body. And, and here's the thing. If, 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 you, if you're not a Christian or, or you, know, you read some of this stuff and you say, well, that, that, that sort of sounds strange. 
Well, I get that. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that sounds strange. I mean, you got floating axe heads, and you got people changing into this. I mean, this is a man who claims to be the Son of God, first of all, and then he takes his people up onto the top of a mountain and he changes into something else. You know, his face turns white, his clothes turn wet. So, I mean, if all that sounds strange, I, I get that. But just because it sounds strange doesn't mean it's not true. And these were reported by eyewitnesses. These are uh, historical events. So as Christians, what we see in this, and this is important to me, uh, the more I read it and I study it, it's one of the few glimpses that we get into what's going to happen to us when we go to heaven. That's why I find this event so important. It's proof. It's proof. If you're a Christian, this is one of the things that we claim to be the proof that Jesus was fully man and fully God. So we get this glimpse of Jesus in his divine glory. We get a glimpse as we look at this and what our glorification is going to be like. When we die, we go to heaven. We glimpse of what it's going to be like when we leave these earthly bodies. Now, again, it, it, sometimes if you, it, it, you just sort of skim through the Bible, maybe you remember some of this stuff when you, when you were a kid in Sunday school, but the word metamorpho that they use here is the same word that the Apostle Paul uses in the book of Romans. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. He says, But be transformed, be transfigured, be metamorphosed, be metamorpho into something else. He says, You do this by the renewing of your mind. What, what what Paul is saying is, when you take Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's a transformation that takes place inside of you. You're no longer that caterpillar. You're now that butterfly. You've been metamorphosed. You've been transformed. You've been transfigured into something else. And as I said earlier, Jesus, God, this Bible, is always about keeping the main thing the main thing. So if, if you do have your Bibles this morning, that's great. Turn to, it to the uh, Gospel of Matthew chapter 17. But if you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. There's a couple left over here. We want you to take them. Take them as you leave. If you have a Bible at home that you find difficult and you like the, the translation that I read, which is a New Living tra Translation most weeks, and I, and I like it because I know it's accurate, but I also know it speaks a language I understand. Some Bibles are very hard for me to understand, and I've been studying them for 20 years. So, so if you like the translation that we read from, they're there, they're free. The reason we do that is we know there's a lot of books in this world that can inform you, but there's only one book that can transform you, and that is our Bibles. It's the good news of Jesus Christ that I found from the very beginning to the very end. Now, Sometimes I like to think of myself as a teaching pastor. I, I love to study. So, so I, one of the things I notice sometimes is we read these things sort of la la la. Verse starts out like this. It says, Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up to a high mountain to be alone. Now we're reading from the Gospel of Matthew, but sometimes you get a little bit more information as you read it from the perspective of somebody else. And like I said, we, we also see this story in the Gospel of Mark, and we see the story in the Gospel of Luke. So, what they tell us is that Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, up onto this mountain to pray. But if you notice, it starts out six days later. So, so what is it? that took place six days before now. What is it that's so important that the Holy Spirit, that the writer of Matthew decides that uh, he has to put this into the scripture? What happened six days before this event that he's about to tell us? And in order to find that answer, we have to go back and, and, and if you look at the text, we're going to see this event that Matthew says takes place six days before. And this is an event that's one of those other great big events, great big momentous events in the ministry of Jesus. It takes place in, in a town called Caesarea Philippi. It's when Jesus was sort of asking his disciples, 
uh, who do people say that I am? You know, hey, because what's the scuttlebutt in the neighborhood? What, what, what is people saying? What's the gossip? What's the rumor? What's my public image? Now, now think about this. This is Jesus asking his closest friends, his 12 disciples, and, and hey, they, they, I can imagine. I mean, I, the scriptures don't say this, but I sort of picture it. Um, Jesus, you know, um, some are saying that you're John the Baptist, okay? They, they, just, you know, John the Baptist said that, that you're, you're him resurrected. He's just been killed, and, and you might be John the Baptist. Others are saying, uh, um, uh, people, uh, um, they're saying you might be the prophet of life. Other people are saying, well, maybe you're Jeremiah, or you're one of the, the other prophets. You know, there's a lot of things being said about you, Jesus, and, and, and some of them are just, you're not who you think, you know, who you say you are, that, 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 that maybe you are this fulfillment of Scripture that they talked about. And I see Jesus, and again, I, I picture things in my mind. I see Jesus, and they're all sitting around the fire, and he just turned with his hand. And Jesus is sort of looking down, and he, he's thinking about what has been said, and he's sort of mulling around in his mind. And, and then he turns back to his disciples. He says, okay, now you told me what other people have said. You told me what the rumors are about myself. But, but let me ask you a question. Who do you say that I am? Who do you think that I am? And this is a question Jesus truly asked each one of us, and it's one of the most important questions that he ever asked. Because according to the scriptures, how we answer this really determines and lets us know who we believe Jesus is and what Jesus is. So when, when you ask yourself, who do I believe? Who, you know, who, who do I believe? But as we read the story, we'll see something immediately happen. 
he just sort of changes the mood of the whole day. I mean, at this point in time, everybody just sort of had to be excited. They had to be happy. Jesus had just confessed, and Peter has confessed, and Jesus sort of agrees with it. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. And God's had to reveal it. So things are about to happen. And then he does something, and it changes the whole mood of the evening. He sits down and he begins, and the scripture says he began to talk plainly. He began to tell his disciples clearly what must take place, what it really meant to be the Messiah. He says, I gotta go to Jerusalem, guys. And when I get there, I'm gonna have to suffer at the hands of the elders, I'm gonna have to suffer at the hands of the chief priests, I'm gonna have to suffer at the hands of the teachers of the law, I'm gonna be betrayed into the hands of I'm going to have to die. I'm going to be killed, and I'll rise on the third day. And now, now the disciples at the time, I think they understood the part about him being killed. I don't think they quite yet understood what it meant that he was going to rise on the third day. So here's Peter, who just said, you are the living God, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ. Jesus tells him these things, and it says he was told clearly what was going to happen. He was told plainly what was going to happen. I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be betrayed, and I'm going to be killed. And what do you think Peter does? This rock, the man who has the keys to the kingdom of heaven. You think Peter's like, okay, hey Jesus, let me tell you something, man. If you go to Jerusalem, I'm going to Jerusalem. In fact, we'll all go to Jerusalem with you. Jesus, where you lead, we're going to follow. Jesus, if you suffer, we'll suffer with you. Jesus, if you're going to die, we're going to die with you. No way. Jesus doesn't do that. Now, Peter doesn't do that. He, 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 and you may, like I said, you may remember some of this from, from Sunday school. You Maybe you've already read it. But, but Peter becomes mad. He, he is outraged. He says, he says, Jesus, I ain't never going to let that happen. Never, Lord. Never, Lord. I, I, I'm not going to. It's unthinkable to me that the Messiah, that Christ, is going to go and be betrayed and be killed at the hands of pagans. That's not going to happen. I think as, as I read this and I, and I think about it, I, you know, how many of us would be the same way? You know, we all like the idea of Jesus being our Savior, don't we? We all like the idea of Jesus being the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. But right after this, Right after Jesus had told Peter he was the rock, that he was going to build his kingdom upon him, that, that he was going to give him the kingdom to heaven, Jesus turns to Peter and he, and he says, Listen, Peter, get away from me, Satan. That is what, what, what Peter must have thought just five minutes ago, and he's the rock, and now he's Satan. He said, that Jesus said, You're a dangerous trap to me, Peter. You're seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's point of view. I, I think that's tough. I think Peter's a lot like us, you know. No, we like the idea of following Jesus. We just don't want to go all the way to the cross with Jesus. We just don't want to go through the suffering that Jesus said we may have to go. You know, Peter's like, there ain't no room in my life for a cross. There's no room in my life for suffering. I don't, I don't want that part, Jesus. I, I want you to come as king. I, I want to be sitting at your right side. I want to be exhausted high and, and, and lifted up. Peter had, Peter had to, to, to be confused. Peter, Peter had to, to feel all kinds of emotion when, when, he, when, when he was told by Jesus himself that you know, you're going to do the wrong eyes. Coming a trap to him. Just a few minutes ago, Peter was walking on board. Now he's sitting, he has to go backwards. Peter's thinking man's ideas and not in God's idea. Peter can't wrap his mind around the full measure of what Jesus has to go through. He doesn't understand the necessity of the cross. And Jesus begins again to tell his disciples plainly in clear language what's going to happen. And then he says some things that I have to tell you that they get really tough. 
I, I, we had a league team meeting yesterday, and I said, you know, I, 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 I had this burden upon my heart because I think we have told people in the United States particularly that following Jesus is this very simple thing. You come up to the altar, and you say a simple prayer, and, and you're safe. But when you start reading the words of Jesus, that, that's not what he says. I mean, right here, right before he this six months journey to, to Jerusalem, Jesus tells them, and therefore he's telling us, he says, you've got to pick up your cross and follow me. He says, you're going to have to deny yourself in order to get to the kingdom of heaven. He says, in order to follow him, you've got to do what I'm going to ready to do. And I'm getting ready to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to pick up my cross, I'm going to surrender to the will of God, and I'm going to deny myself. Jesus warns his disciples, and by association, he's warning us the dangers of forfeiting our souls to gain the entire world. He tells them, and he tells us, God one day is going to judge us for all the things we've done and all the things we haven't done. Jesus is telling them, and he's telling us that sometimes we're going to have to lay some things down. We're going to have to lay down our own desires. We're going to have to deny ourselves. We're going to have to do what God listens to. And tell, we have to listen to God and do what He tells us to do because one day we'll stand before Him and we have to give an account of our actions. We have to give an account of the things we did and the things that we did. And, and I know that sometimes this is not popular teaching. If you've been coming here for a while, this, this is not the kind of message I normally give. I, and I know that some of you, this might even go against what you like to hear. And maybe there's somebody here that even goes against what you've been taught before. But these aren't my words. These are the words of Jesus. And he said, you've got to see things through God's eyes and the next world, not through your own eyes in this world. And sometimes you just think there, so what does it mean to pick up our cross? I picture to this too. We, we, we think of the cross today in a different term. We, we have a little cross on the back of our car and call ourselves a Christian. We wear a t shirt with a cross on. We have a chain around our neck. But, but it wasn't a symbol of Christianity when Jesus made this statement. In fact, Jesus, if you think about it, Jesus had never even gone to the cross yet. The people he was talking to at that time, the, the audience he was talking to, understood what the cross was. It, it was a symbol of, uh, of suffering. It was a symbol of humiliation. You were stripped naked. You put a 70-pound beam on the back of your, your shoulders, and you were carrying it to the place that you were going to die in. When Jesus said, just like today, you got to pick up your cross, you got to deny yourself. Some of the people turned away. They said, I, I can't do that. I'll follow you if you're the king. I'll follow you if you're the Lord. But if I'm going to deny myself, if I'm going to work in this thing, I, I don't think I want any parts of it. And I don't want you to misinterpret me. You know, I, I just sat here and we got ready to do our tithes and offerings, and I said, okay, God wants to bless us. It, it's true. I, I don't want you to misinterpret what I'm saying here. God's desire is to bless us. I mean, we are children of God. We are the heirs to the kingdom of God. We are made in God's image. But I want you to know, God cares more about your holiness than your happiness. So we have to see things through His eyes and the next world, not through our own eyes in this world. Because following Jesus isn't always going to be easy. You have to lay some things aside. You have to deny yourself some things. And following Jesus may not always be easy, but I can tell you that it is always worth it. It may not always be easy, but it is always worth it. So after Jesus tells his disciples all this, Jesus begins this long journey of going to Jerusalem. One that's going to take him and his disciples about six months to make. And it would take him a while, but Jesus knew what he had to do. The kingdom of God had been promised, and Jesus, and this is what this story is about. Jesus is about to get a glimpse, just a little glimpse, to a few of his disciples, a foretaste of the glory that they can expect when they get to heaven. It says six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up to a high mountain to be alone. We know they were going up there to pray. It says, as the men watched, Jesus' appearance was 
transformed or transfigured so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Now I try to picture sometimes of that in my mind. His face began to shine. His clothes became bright as white or bright as light. And as I, and I, I read a lot of different translations of the Bible, and a lot of the translations of the Bible, they use different terms when it comes to this word metamorpho. Some say transfigured. Some say Jesus' outward appearance changed. Some says Jesus was completely changed. Some say that Jesus was changed from the inside out. And I think the reason behind that is in His glory, in His divine glory, there are not human words that can describe it. We do the best that we can, but it's impossible to describe in human terms Jesus and all His glory. Jesus is preparing His disciples. This is a, a story of glory. Sometimes we just read this la 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 and we, we sort of take it for granted and move on to the next section. But it says his face shine like the sun. His garments glisten and gleam like the light. Jesus is showing them. He's showing us that there is triumph through humiliation. He'd already told them they're going to the cross. That's where he's hit. He's going to be killed. He's going to be humiliated. There is triumph through humiliation. There's a crown beyond the cross. Remember, as I said earlier, God's always trying to keep the main thing, the main thing. God's trying to draw us closer to Him. He's trying to draw us nearer to Him. But Peter, this guy who had just called Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, the, the Christ, Peter can't see the necessity of the cross. Peter couldn't see that in order to get the keys to the kingdom of heaven, he had to see Jesus in all His glory. Before you can peach before you can preach Christ, yet you have to know who Christ is. Before you can tell people the story about the cross, you have to understand the necessity of the cross. Seeing Jesus glorified and the necessity of the cross is the heart and the core of the Christian message. Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Now keep in mind, Moses was, was a couple thousand years before this time period. Elijah was a couple, you know, several hundred years, about 700 years before this time here. We go back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, and here's what Matthew says. It sort of explains why Moses and Elijah were there with Jesus that day. Sometimes we overlook them. We just say, okay, they were there, that's part of the story, it's okay. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of prophets. To abolish them, but to fulfill them. See what Jesus is doing here, what God is doing here is He's teaching Peter and He's teaching us that Christ is truly the fulfillment of the law. That's why Moses is there. Moses is the person that the law was given to. He's teaching us not only is Jesus the fulfillment of the law, He's also the fulfillment of the prophecy. All these prophecies that were told 700, 800, 900 years before Jesus was born, he said, Elijah the prophet is there to show us that Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecies. Moses and Elijah, both there, and they're there in their glorified bodies. And what we see is that Peter, John, they all knew who they were. They never met him before, but in their glorified body, they knew who they were. The Holy Spirit had to reveal that to us. That it gives us a foretaste of what we're going to see. The Holy Spirit will reveal to us what we need to know when we need to know it. It gives us this wonderful glimpse of, of what's going to happen when we get to heaven. Suddenly, Moses is there showing us that Jesus Christ truly is the fulfillment of the law. And Elijah is there, showing us that, that Jesus is truly the fulfillment of the prophets. He's the one that they've been talking about. He's the one that they've been expecting. He's the one that fits the mold. Like I said earlier, sometimes we get a better picture by looking at, at some of the other writers of the same story. We, we look at what Luke has to say. We look at what Mark has to say. They tell us some of the details 
that uh, Matthew has left out. And one of the most important details that Matthew leaves out, in my opinion anyway, is that in the Gospel of Luke, Luke tells us exactly what Jesus and Moses and Elijah were talking about. And I think this is important. In chapter 9 of the Gospel of Luke, Luke says they were speaking about his exodus. In some translations, I think the New Living Translation says departure. They were talking about his departure, his exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. They're talking about Jesus going to the cross, how he was going to be killed, how he was going to leave this world. I think the reason is that God is always about keeping the main thing, the main thing. Yes, Christ came so that we can live like it, we can live more abundantly here. But God is more concerned about us spending all eternity with Him. So here is Elijah and Moses. They're at the top of the mountain. They're all in their glorified body with Jesus. And they're talking about Jesus going to the cross. And again, from the, from the other accounts, we, we learned that after they had traveled to the top of this mountain, and I say these things so that, so that we can't make excuses later. The other accounts say that, that Peter... James and John, they were tired, they fell asleep when they got to the top of the mountain. But Peter tells us later, and Luke records, that these men were fully awake. They saw them in their glory, and the two men standing with them. They were not asleep. This was not a dream. They were fully awake. Now this is what we know about Peter. You study Peter. Peter's a man of action. Peter acts sometimes without thinking. He's like me. He, he'll go out and do it and say, you know, I, I'm not sure if that was a great idea or not, but, but I'm a man of action. I've got to do things. And, 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 Mark, and Mark and Luke sort of put a comical twist on it because they say uh, Peter had no clue what he was doing. Peter did not have a clue what he was doing, but Peter was going to do something anyway because Peter is a man of action. Peter says, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. Now, I get this, too. Because I, I think, you know, so many of the spheres, so many uh, things of the unknown, one of the greatest fears all of us have is what's going to happen to us when we die. But there's no fear here. I'm telling you, if I'm on top of a mountain and three people come to me and they're glorified and they're shining, I'm going to be a little worried. <laughs> I think what he's showing us is, is no matter where we are, the Holy Spirit will give us what we need when we need it, no matter how bad the circumstances are. Peter saying, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters in memorial. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter, Peter's this man action. He's got to do something. But what we're going to see is that there is a time for work. <coughs> and there is a time for rest. And there is a time for worship. You think about this. You know, we already talked about it. They had already rested. They got to the top of the mountain. They took a little nap. This is not a time for work. This is a time for worship. When they come down the mountain, we're going to look at this next week. When they come down the mountain, the first thing Jesus does is drive them to you. There's a time for work. There's a time for rest. But there's a time for worship. We come to the Lord's house. We come to church. It needs to be put away. We need to put our iPads, our cell phones, our things like that away. Work is done. It's time to worship. We've we rested before we got here. It's a time to worship. There's plenty of time for work. There's plenty of time for rest later. But now's the time for worship. We always got to keep the main thing the main thing. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud... Cloud, not clouds. A voice from the cloud said... This is my son, my dearly loved son, who brings me great joy. Listen to him. I think that's the part we mess up so bad sometimes. I, I, heard, this, I heard this story the other day. And I don't know whether you've ever had this happen to you or not, but uh, if you've ever been on a plane with a screaming kid, you know how miserable that can be. Now, what makes it even worse is that kid happens to be your kid. Because you're doing everything you can to keep this baby quiet. And they're just screaming on this plane. This kid's having a terrible 
temper trapping, his feet are kicking, that the mom's embarrassed, she's doing everything she can, it's right before takeoff, and all of a sudden out of the back of the plane comes this old general, Air Force general. And he walks over to the kid, he whispers something in his ear, and he points to his wings and his ribbons, and sort of rubs the kid on the head, and smiles at the mom, and walks back. Well, the kid quiets down immediately. Gets in, kid gets in his, his seat, fastens his seatbelt. All of a sudden, the, the plane just erupts in, a, in applause. The old Jenner, he just, he just keeps walking to the back of the plane, and finally one of the stewards had just reached out and said, uh, man, what, what did you say to that kid? The general said, oh, I just sat down and went through to him, and I, I showed him my, my Air Force wings. And I showed him all my ribbons, and I showed him all my service stars, and I just told him, these give me the right to throw anybody out of war off of any plane that I want. <laughs> it's amazing how much people will listen to you when you have the right kind of authority and you can back it up with the proper connections. This is what we see in the transfiguration of Jesus. He has the authority, and he's given us the credentials that say he can back up who he says he is. He is the one who has come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Later on in the scriptures, you'll find that the, the, the apostles who represent the church, Moses represents the law, Elijah represented the prophet, the apostles represent the church. They testify that Jesus is the Christ. And now God the Father testifies to the fact that Jesus is the Son, that he has the authority, that he has the credentials, and that we need to listen to him. We need to know that God is pleased with the work of Christ has done on earth, that he now sits at the right hand of his Father. This is what we need to know. We need to know that we need to listen to Him and obey Him. We need to listen to what Jesus says. God says, this is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. With Him I am well pleased. Listen to Him. Because here's what, I, here's what we were talking about earlier. It's one thing to say you believe in Jesus. It's another thing entirely to say that you listen to Jesus and you obey his commands. It's always about keeping the main thing the main thing. Seeing our Lord Jesus and his glory, knowing of his departure, his death on a cross. Why did he do that? He did it for our sins. We need to worship him, listen to him, know that he is the Son of God. And I just want you to think about this just for a, a moment. How great would your life be if you continually listened to the Son of God and obeyed what He said? How great would your life say uh, if you followed the Scriptures and, and what Jesus says about how to handle our relationship? If we followed the Scriptures and listened to how He says to handle our finances? If we, if we, if we listened to the Scriptures and told how to take care of us and serve others? How great would your life be See, seeing Jesus glorified, the necessity of the cross is the heart and the core of the Christian living. Before you can preach Christ, you must know Christ. Before you can tell the story of the cross, you must know the necessity of the cross. You can't do that unless you see Jesus glorified. You can't know Jesus and you can't see the necessity of the cross unless you take the time to stop and listen to Jesus. Sometimes I, I know we all have these questions. Why should we listen to Jesus? What well, if for no other reason God commands us to listen to Jesus? Doesn't he deserve to be heard? And I thought about this in other reasons. If we don't listen to Jesus, who are we going to listen to? Because who has our best interest at heart? Our boss or Jesus? Yeah, even to the people that we love, most of the time, everything we do is really with selfish intent. You know, I have a 
love my kids, but I want them to act the way I want them to act. I love my wife, but I really wish she would act the way I, I, I want her to act. I don't have always their best intentions in mind. I have my best intentions in mind. What about your boss? You know, they want you to do certain things at work. Do you want to do it because it makes you happy or because it makes the company happy? Jesus always had your best interest in heart. He's the one that gives us comfort in times of trouble. Jesus is the one who heals our wounds. Jesus is the one who offers us wisdom. Jesus is the one who makes the impossible possible. Jesus is the one who redeems our souls and offers us eternal life. He's our master. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. He's the one who has our best interest at heart all the time, not some of the time. If you're a sinner and you know you are, you need to hear your Savior's voice. If you're wandering and you've lost your way, you need to hear your shepherd's voice. If you're sick and you need, you need to hear the great physician's voice. Keep the main thing, the main thing. If we don't listen to Jesus, who are we going to listen to? What are we to hear? What are we to hear? We're to hear about the sinless life of Jesus. We're to hear of the holy actions of Jesus. We're to hear the sufferings of Jesus. We're to hear of His redeeming death. His death which was substituted for our death. So not only what are we to hear, I mean, we're to hear about the perfect and the permanent sacrifice for our sins. We're to, we're to hear of the resurrection. We're to hear of His glory so that we can have the assurance of our resurrection and our glory. But where, not just what, but where are we to listen for Jesus? We listen as He speaks through the Scriptures, as, as we read the Bible. We listen to the Word of God through His servants, through the preachers and the teachers of the Word. We hear Him in that small, still voice in our heart. We hear Him through the power of the Holy Spirit. But not just where and what, when should we hear Him? And the answer to that is that we're to hear Him forevermore. We're to continually hear Him. We're to hear Him in the morning. We're to hear Him in the afternoon. We're to hear Him in the evening. Always be listening. Always be hearing. He who has an ear, let him hear. The scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The scripture says give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. I, 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 I put some thought in this. What does the transfiguration mean to me? What does the transfiguration mean to you? What does the transfiguration mean to us? means through the power of the Holy Spirit we can see Jesus glorified and we can see the necessity of the cross. We can see Jesus glorified and the necessity of the cross as the heart of Christian living. What does the transfiguration mean to us? It means that we can know without question that we can have the full assurance we can have without a shadow of doubt that Jesus is the one who has fulfilled the law and he's the one who fulfilled all the prophets. He's the one that that the Ten Commandments are fulfilled through? What does the Ten Federation mean to us? It means that through his departure, through his exodus, his death on the cross, that we can have life after death, that we too can be raised from the dead, that we too can have a glorified body. It gives those of us that make Jesus Lord over our eyes a peace that our eyes cannot see. What does the transfiguration of Jesus mean to us? It means there's a time to be in his rest. There is a time for Christian service. And there is a time for worship. It means that we're to keep the main thing the main thing. What does the transfiguration of Jesus mean to us? It means that Jesus is the light of light. He is the very God of God. That Jesus is indeed the very Son of the living God. His Father's voice confirms it. The transfiguration is a picture of the glory of God, the light into darkness. It points to triumph and tribulation. The transfiguration shows us the crown after the cross, a glorified life to everyone who believes, a sweet eternity for us, won by a bitter death by Him. What does the transfiguration mean to us? It means a hint at the kingdom to come. The kingdom of glory, when we're all going to see Jesus for who he truly is. It's hints at a time when Jesus is going to come to, to raise us up, when we too will be other believers who are glorified. The 
question still remains. Will you listen to him? Are you going to meet Jesus as your Savior? Will you meet Jesus as your Savior or will you meet him as your judge? I mean, if the kingdom of God came today, if you were to meet Jesus today, would you be transfigured? Would you be transformed? Would you be renewed? Would you be glorified because you listened and put your faith in Him who is the glory? Or would you be judged and found warning? Would you be judged and found warning and cast into a lake of fire for all eternity? I want you to know that we, we speak about many things in this church. We're getting ready to go into a sermon series right after Easter called the Abundant Life. But the season of Lent is to remember what Christ has done for us. It's a time of renewal. It is a time of repentance. It's a time of growing closer to God and understanding who God is and what He has done for us. It's a time of understanding that He loved you so much that He gave His Son that He could spend all eternity. Later in Peter's life, he, he writes down what he saw that day. It's found in, in what we call the second epistle of Peter. Down in chapter 5, he writes about this experience. He tells it as he saw it. I mean, we forget that sometimes. We think the Bible is just this, this made-up story. These were real people who saw real things and then wrote it down so we could have it. Peter said, we did not follow clearly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to His majesty. For He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to Him from the majestic glory saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With Him I is well pleased. Listen to Him. There's some way of making this up. Peter says, we saw it, we heard it. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. Peter says, what I already knew, I am now even more certain of. Right before this, six days later, six days before, I had confessed him as the Messiah. I had confessed him as Christ. I had confessed him as the Son of the living God. And on that day, it was confirmed. It was certain. He says that we have heard the word of the prophets and it is made more certain. And then Peter himself reminds us we need to listen. And you will do well to pay attention to it as a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. Getting ready to close. The question is this, have you heard it? Have you been listening? Have you seen his glory? Keep the main thing, the main thing. Because it's one thing to say that you believe. It's another thing entirely to say that you have heard. Have you listened? Is he calling you this morning? You know, I, I made this little makeshift altar up here. If you want to come up here and pray, I'm going to be here. I'm going to ask Bryce and Jimmy to come up. They're going to sing one last song. Maybe there's a need in your life. Maybe something's going on in your life and it's just too big for you to handle. Come up here. I'll pray with you. I'll pray for you. Pray to the one who can handle it. Because Jesus knows your fears. Jesus knows your trials. He knows what you're going through. Maybe the day today you just got to stop trying to do it on your own. I mean, there have been times in my life when I worked so hard to get something done. And finally, the problem got so big I couldn't handle it. <laughs> And amazing, when I turn it over to Jesus, sometimes the circumstances didn't change, but I changed. But there were times when the circumstances changed as well. Maybe today is the day that, that you should start listening to Jesus. Maybe today is the day that you yeah, want to finally take him up on the wall for salvation. Because God's part is always on salvation. He always keeps the main day Right after this, verse 7, Matthew says the disciples were terrified. Do you think about this? They were terrified. They felt face to God. But it says they worshipped Him. They, they didn't let it stop them. They were terrified. But they, maybe that's where some of you are right now. You're like, I don't want to come up there. 
I'm scared. You know, what's my wife going to think? What are my friends going to think? What about these people in church? You know, they thought I was already saved. I don't, none of us care about that. We care about you. We love you. Maybe that's where you are. You're just scared at this point, but you, you heard God's voice and you just reluctant. But I want to show you something. Jesus doesn't leave you there. He doesn't want you to follow him out of fear. Jesus came and touched him. He said, it. Get up. Don't be afraid. See, when they saw Jesus in all his glory, they're no longer afraid. Jesus will lift you up. He'll comfort you. He'll whisper in your ear. Don't be afraid because I got all this under control. Keep the main thing the main thing. God's heart is always on salvation. Verse 8 says, when they looked up, they saw no one but Jesus. Don't look to man. Don't look to your money. Don't look to your health. Don't look to no one except Jesus, the Son of the living God. And listen. Let them sing. If you want to come up up here, if not, you can stay right where you are, and I'll pray with you after the service.